You're listening to Content Logistics, a podcast for B2B marketers looking to build a content engine that drives revenue. In each episode, Camille Trent interviews the marketers behind the best content marketing flywheels and uncovers the tactical aspects of content production from first draft to first customer. Hello there, and welcome to another episode of Content Logistics. I'm your host, Camille Trent, and this episode is brought to you by my good friends, Tristan and Justin over at Motion. They are an agency for B2B tech marketers looking to launch podcasts like this one. If you are wanting to launch a podcast or up-level your current podcast, but you need help with production, with how to think of content repurposing, definitely check them out. They make all that easy. They might make my life easy. Big fan. Today, our guest is Eli Schwartz. He is a growth advisor to companies like WordPress, Gusto, Pendo, companies you've probably heard of. And he's also the former growth director at SurveyMonkey and the author of Product-Led SEO. So successful guy, done a lot of things, especially in the SEO world. So I wanted to bring him on to walk through the logistics of Product-Led SEO. All right, Eli, welcome to the show. Uh, You literally wrote the book on Product-Led SEO, uh, which kind of like shook up this idea of SEO needing to be led by keywords, uh, which I think when the average marketer thinks of SEO, they think keywords and how do we do things around keywords and just very like productized, very like commoditized. And so you wrote your book, you distinguish product led SEO from the more commoditized, easy approach to SEO. And specifically you say, unlike keyword research driven SEO efforts, a product led SEO strategy needs to have product market fit. So can you just expand on that? What is product-led SEO for the listeners and why is product market fit essential to it? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So just to expand on that, I I actually had a great conversation this morning with an e-commerce company that produces a commoditized product. And we talked about the idea of really inserting product-led SEO into their product. And they're like, okay, great. So that means we're gonna really write blog posts about our topic. And I'm like, no, that's precisely what we're not going to do. Your product is this e-commerce product and this e-commerce site. So we're going to build in the user demand. We're going to build in what this specific user audience wants into the actual post, which is the, the landing pages where they sell the product. It's not about making this tangential strategy of, well, we sell widgets and on the widget page, we're really good at converting the people that arrive to the widget into buying our widgets and to paying the price we want for the widgets. But when it comes to SEO, we're going to write these blog pages about how you use the widget and how you put the widget on your table and how you gift the widget. Like that's disconnected from the actual marketing strategy. When you're doing product-led SEO, if you believe, and you know, I find that many times there isn't an audience, but if you believe that there isn't going to be coming from a search engine, you want to make your entire product, your entire go-to-market about what that audience wants, what that audience is going to be searching, Googling more than likely, and what they're going to be expecting and finding and landing on the page. And ideally, well, actually not ideally, they have to be converting. If they're not converting, then there's no point. Then you're just a media company. Media companies are okay to drive traffic and just have people leave. But if you sell something else, if you do something else, if you're you know, a SaaS company, you have to get people through that funnel and through that buyer journey. And that's what product-led SEO is. It's really your SEO, your marketing is a part of that product and a part of your go to market. And that's why product market fit is so important because if you don't have product market fit, then what are you marketing? What is your SEO? It's just like, you know, taking whatever your search category is and throwing it into Ahrefs or SEMrush or, you know, any other keyword tool you have and just finding the top keywords in that category and writing content about it for what purpose? Yeah. You said something really interesting in there and you kind of glazed over it, but the fact that most most companies aren't there yet with product market fit, right? You find that like most don't have an audience yet. Do you want to dive like deeper into that? Or maybe I misunderstood it, but the companies that you talk to, they're trying to dive into SEO before they're ready. I I mean, I would say many companies actually do have an audience. So even if there's a startup, so let's say you have a startup and they've raised a ton of money and they don't really have users, but they have a pitch. They have like something that convinced somebody to give them a ton of money. So that is ideally their audience. And that is who they should be going out to the market with, with their SEO strategy of, you know, say, let's say it's um, a Gen Z audience that is based in um, Nebraska, right? 
and that's who they're selling to. So why would their SEO be anything but a Gen Z audience based in Nebraska? So th that's where I think SEO really gets confusing because all this advice around SEO is, hey, let's let's find our top keywords and let's write content about our top keywords and not like, let's find out what our audience is actually searching. So even if you don't really have an audience yet, you know who you want your audience to be. And there is a learning process in this and understanding how your audience is going to conform and how your audience is going to convert. So what I do tell a lot of early stage companies is don't focus on SEO just yet. Focus on paid media. I know it's it's uh, heretical for someone in SEO to say don't do SEO, but I you know I, I think it's important. I think if you focus on paid media, depending on the vertical and depending on the type of product, you get almost instant gratification. So say it's e-commerce, you're focused on paid media, either people do buy or they don't buy. If it's SaaS, depends on how expensive it is and what they're selling, but they either will fill out a lead and become part of the demand gen uh, stream and an MQL and an SQL, or they will not, and you'll know. And then once you've really nailed what your performance strategy is and how you're converting and what your buyer journey is, then you can take that and say, that is what we should build SEO around. But if you haven't really done that, it's a hypothesis. And SEO, you know, some people say it takes two weeks. It doesn't take two weeks. It takes, you know, six to 18 months. So SEO is going to take a really long time. And if you do the wrong thing, if you're going after the wrong market, it's going to take you 18 months to figure out that you've made a mistake. Whereas if you build it on a successful performance strategy, you'll know pretty much what is going to work because those are very likely the same kind of people. Yeah. And to me, that's like, that's spoken like a true growth marketer, right? Is like, how can we get those learnings faster? And like, how can we grow in the short term and but also set us up for the long term? And that's what I've found too, is whether it's social or paid social, both of those are going to get you that immediate gratification in terms of like content market fit, right? In terms of like, what content is our audience consuming? And then how can we take those learnings for maybe more longer form content or for SEO or things that are going to be more of like an investment channel. So yeah. that's like, that's like the big insight um, for me. And I think that's the big takeaway for people too, is like, think like a growth marketer, think about like, what are my like, Q1 goals, but then how can I also like set a company up for success later and just be very like mindful of, of the budget and of waste and of like getting, getting to product market fit faster so we can get to this like, yeah, content fit faster, basically. So yeah. that one other thing uh, that I wanted to touch on uh, is media company. This idea of like building a media company as a SaaS company is really popular right now. And so, and you talk about it in your book and which I think was kind of ahead of its time. So distinguish a SEO strategy for a media company versus an, a SaaS company and just what your thoughts are on this idea of building a media company and the popularity behind that. Yes. So I, I think what's really, really important and I want to underscore this as many times as we can during this conversation is that SEO is about revenue. SEO is about some sort of KPI. And I find that that gets confusing with SEO because they, people create alternative KPIs, which is the worst KPI ever, which is ranking. So I'm doing SEO because I want to rank, but ranking on its own doesn't pay the bills. So the, the outcome of any SEO strategy should be the business KPI, which if it's sales, then it's sales. If it's leads, it's leads. If it's app downloads, whatever it is, it's the same business KPI. So now when it comes to a media company, if you're building an actual media company, and I've worked for media companies in the past, it's it, the revenue comes from advertising or affiliate revenue. So I would do SEO, very tangential SEO, maybe not on what I'm you know purely focused on, because if I can get eyeballs, then I can get those eyeballs to come to the site and then I can get them to spin more pages, which again generates more impression revenue. And the more pages they spin, the more likely they are to click on one of those ads if I get paid with a click or click on affiliate offer if I get paid by affiliate offers. So that's where SEO can be very easy. And you look at the kind of things and, you know, frankly, I'm embarrassed for the big media nowadays, like CNN and, and New York Times, who like start writing about all these things just to generate affiliate revenue. Like I saw an article come up on my Discover feed today from Google on CNN's top credit cards to get in January of 2022. Like they're just trying to generate affiliate revenue from that. So it is what it is, but like that's media. So, so they can do that. They can drive those clicks. They'll generate affiliate revenue and then they'll get me to read about something else in the news, maybe drive some more affiliate revenue. So media can get away with that. Now, if you're a SaaS company, you sell a SaaS, you sell a tool, you sell a subscription, you sell a download, whatever it is. So if you create content 
And the only thing interesting about that content is reading it, but you're not going to get people to convert, then what's the value? So I once consulted for a company that was in a two-sided marketplace. They were on a little bit of an HR space. So they had the employers and they had the employees. Now there's far more employees in the world than there are employers in the world, just, you know, by, by factor of numbers and the traffic and the search traffic obviously is weighted heavier towards employees. So for whatever reason, the SEO advice they'd been given in the past was these are tough keywords to focus on. And they did it, you know, they were very focused on those keywords and they built a lot of great content and they got a lot of traffic, but none of those clicks converted because you had a bunch of employees coming to their websites and they were doing things that employees do, but they were not employers. They were not the kind of people that would buy the SaaS product. So that's really what it comes down to is, are you building SEO? Are you, it's dollars. Are you investing the dollars in an SEO channel that does, that will never convert for you because it's the wrong audience, or are you investing the dollars into a channel that could convert for you? Now, the exception here is, could you build a media company that builds a presence which then establishes you as a thought leader in that space. And then you have an audience, which you can then sell to. And I think HubSpot is the most successful there. HubSpot on its own is a CRM product. It's a, a sales product. And it, there isn't that much search demand around their core business. There's only so many keywords you could ever search to find HubSpot. Now HubSpot did a fantastic job of creating a media property around marketing. So they're thought leaders, they're, they're brand leaders in marketing. And now they have this big audience and they have a huge conference and everyone knows about them. And then they can pitch their product to them. But that's a very thought out strategy. It's not, we're going to write this blog post and then hopefully we can trick people into wanting to download our product and to trial our product. It's really, we're building a product and we understand how valuable it is. And then this is our user base and we can sell into them because they know who we are. And Salesforce has sort of done the same thing. And they don't necessarily do it with SEO content. They do it with their Dreamforce conference where they get thousands of people to come into San Francisco who are not necessarily Salesforce users, but then they can sell Salesforce to them. So HubSpot's done a much better job of building a media property online. And there are definitely other companies that do that. But you have to be very clear. You're investing in a media property. You're investing in eyeballs. You're investing in brand, which then you can then sell to. You're not investing in media property, which you're now going to put house ads on and hope it converts because that usually will not drive profitable revenue. Yeah, I, I think that that's a great breakdown. And in there, so connecting the two, connecting like SEO or content to revenue in general, there's a couple different ways you can do it. Obviously, SEO, actually out of the out of the different ways you can go to market with content is one of the easier things to track. But interested to see if you recommend, and I guess it depends on business strategy, but if you recommend tracking uh, just based on conversions, or if you're also meeting with, and working with, you know, mops and rev ops to like track it all the way to all the way to sales. Right. And all the way to like, to full deals, like at, at companies and just how you're able to have that relationship to be able to track effectively content and SEO to revenue. Yeah. I mean, to be totally transparent here, it's very, very difficult to really track it through the longer the sales funnel is and the longer it takes to convert a, a customer from search, the harder it really is going to be to to prove that it came from search. So my favorite kind of businesses are e-commerce. They come, they convert, or they don't convert. It's, I guess, depends on the product. If it's expensive, it'll take a little bit longer. But now think about something like, let's say automotive, where you're doing, uh, you do a search, I'm interested in buying a, a new Tesla, and I do a search and I read about the Tesla, and then I go to the dealership and I test drive a Tesla, and then maybe Tesla gets lucky and they can retarget me, but there's so many touches. And then I go to my neighbor's car and I check out their car. And then I think about it and then I go to another dealer and I, I decide to buy it from that dealer. Like, how do you ever prove that it came from that Google search? It's almost impossible. The same would really happen with SaaS. And, and you know, I think it's even more interesting when you involve salespeople in the process that everyone starts taking credit for it. So when you have sales, sales is like, oh, pat me on the back. I closed the deal. And demand gen's like, pat me on the back. I got great MQLs. And SEO's like, well, their first touch six months ago came from a search. Uh, just leave me be, I'm, I'm here quiet in the corner. Like that's very, very difficult. So you could try to build rev ops there. Very, very challenging. You really need a lot of data. So I've never been that successful at it. And again, the more expensive it is and the longer it takes, the harder it is. So what you want to do is really come up with some sort of intermediary conversions and proof that this is working and generally going in the right direction. So is it 
someone signing up for an email? Is it someone uh, becoming a follower on social media? Is it, um, you know, someone that you can retarget and they end up in a demand gen pool and they join a webinar or something like that? Like don't have the expectation that it's going to be one and done and they're going to click and they're going to convert, but you just want to directionally say this traffic is valuable and I'm driving potential users. I'm not just driving potential eyeballs. Yeah, I was, I was just going to ask about like leading metrics that you would look at in the interim and it does sound like yeah, content consumption and content like depth and that life cycle marketing side of things is one way to do it, right? Just to see if, if people are consuming the content, if they are bouncing or if they're staying, if they're coming back to content, anything else to add there? I really, yeah, any sort of leading metric you can come up with. And I think retargeting is really important to like partner with their performance team and say, am I providing a good retargeting pool for you? And it could be really cheap, right? To retarget that audience. So am I in expanding that pool with search users that find them, you know, or, you know again, search is going to be very, very top of funnel. Uh, the, the best way, and I, I like to think of, and I, the way I wrote about it in my book is like, I like to think about search, organic search and performance, SEM, search engine marketing, working together as, you know, part of one long journey rather than the way it unfortunately ends up being in too many companies, which is that they're at odds with each other. They're like two sides, you know, two sides of the same coin and they're not, I really like to think about them on a continuum. So organic search is all the way at the top of funnel. I'm getting long tail keywords that would never be profitable for me to advertise against. Uh, performance is keywords that I could never rank on because they're too competitive. So if you think about it like that, like that's the funnel where I want to create a lot of content that rings in long tail and then performance will go and retarget them and help convert them. We're not necessarily even retarget. It's I've introduced you to the brand and now you're going to search the brand or you're maybe going to search something about the brand and then I can convert your own performance. So again, any sort of metric you can say that organic is helping to lead towards that conversion will you know, help with the argument of organic needs more budget. And this is something we should continuously invest in. Yeah, big, big fan of just working with the paid team uh, be, to basically validate the content, but I hadn't heard it how you said it of have them basically audit the or give you feedback on the retargeting, like uh, the quality of like the retargeting um, that you're generating for them, right? That retargeting art audience. I've heard it from sales, right? Of like, you can talk to sales, find out if those leads are good, call them yourselves, like see what the quality is. But there is that, that cool kind of like intermediary of, is this a uh, retargeting audience that I'm creating for you? Is it, and I like that as a good like feedback loop. Okay, so jumping uh, into the when can we and should we consider product-led SEO? So we talked about this a little bit, uh, the stage of company, product market fit. So anything else to add on this front of who is this a good strategy for and who is it not a good strategy for? I, I think that's a really, really important question. And I, I'd say that many, many companies, it's not a good strategy for at all. And if it's not a good strategy, and I'm very biased here, of course, then I don't know that SEO is even something worth investing into. Because I think product-led SEO is the only way you really want to do SEO if you're if you're going all in on SEO. And, but if you're not going all in on SEO, let's say you're a local business, and you know I say this all the time, like you look at a lot of local businesses, they have terrible websites, and I, they do themselves a disservice by having such a bad website. So they're almost better off not having a website at all. They're all better off having a Google My Business page or having a Facebook page or terribly they have to do this, but investing in their Yelp page, right? But like not having their own ugly website that loads slow, that has like a Wix or WordPress or Weebly or GoDaddy logo at the bottom um, or with terrible pictures or whatever it is, right? So like those kind of businesses, I don't think they should do SEO because they're not really going to be, um, it's not something they should invest in. They should rank on their own domain name. If you're a moving company, um, you know, ranking and moving in your local place is probably going to be very hard for your own website. And if you're investing a ton of resources and ton of time into it, you might be better off putting that elsewhere in the business. Uh, same goes with, with any other sort of product website where it's people are looking for that specific thing and there's no competition. Like an example might be Google cloud, right? I had a conversation with Google cloud a couple of years ago about their SEO, um, potentially joining their team. Google cloud competes with two other companies or maybe, you know, three, right? But Microsoft and Amazon, and no one's making a decision about buying Google cloud just because Google's number one on Google. Like they're going to really investigate their competition. So there, I also, I don't think it makes sense to really invest in SEO. So the companies where I think it makes sense to invest in SEO and, and you know, again, biased product-led SEO 
are companies where you have a search audience. People are going to be searching for that. And you want to build something tangible that when they search, they find you and they're going to, again, join that the journey, join that funnel and potentially become a user. Anything else? I struggle to comprehend why that would be a place you would invest significant dollars in SEO rather than other marketing channels. Yeah, I think that's great. I think a lot of what content and podcasts like lack on this, this how to is like, is this a good, like, is this a good strategy for me? You know, like let's, before we dive into this, like, how about you like pre-qualify yourself and like, is this, is this even going to work for me before I invest too many, too much uh, resources in it? So I love the level setting there. Next one in your book, uh, you say that SEO should live within product. So how do you see that relationship between SEO marketing product in this, uh, product-led SEO strategy? I think SEO should live with a product. And I had a, a, you know, a unique experience in that for a few years in my career, I reported to a chief product officer and I reported to a, a CTO. So I, I was able to experience this and learn this. Now, most companies, this is not going to be the case. And in my book, I, I talked about how don't get down on yourself just because you report to marketing. And that's just where SEO ends up being. The reason I think SEO should report to product is because if you're shaping your SEO around how you go to market around your product pages, the SEO needs to be within product and not on a marketing team because marketing will usually bring something to market. Whereas in my, in my worldview of doing product led SEO and, and like the, you know, earlier I talked about this e-commerce company. So if the e-commerce company is going to go to market with something that their market isn't looking for, and then the SEO team is expected to bring traffic to it. How do they do that if the pages are not targeting that specific audience? So that's why I think if SEO is really about building an exact product, building what users are looking for, it has to be on product. So you have that viewpoint immediately when you're developing the product, you have that viewpoint when you're structuring the website, you're having that viewpoint when you commission the designs and everything about it, then SEO is built in rather than, well, we built it. And after the fact, we're going to come in and SEO it. I don't think that really works. So, and again, it's unfortunate that's the way most companies do it. And that's why it is challenging to be, have successful SEO because the challenge, the changes you want to make, they're already baked in. It would be really you know, difficult to come back around and, and you know, make those changes. So, and, and this really the, the same goes with, you know, anything you're doing around SEO, which is, you know, even the way agencies do it, agencies are very deliverable based. And I pride myself on not being an agency. So an agency is going to come and say, well, here's how you should be doing SEO. But if they're handing that plan to a marketing team who is even, you know, the agency is even further disconnected from the product team. So they're saying, well, here's how you should do it. You sh this is what your homepage should look like. How's that marketing team going to go and make those changes to the, the homepage, you know, unless that box is being opened up again. So that's why I feel that it's more effective when it's on product teams. But even if you are in a marketing team, as long as you, you have a voice, as long as you have a seat at the table, when the product is being developed, I think you can be successful. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's great. Um, the things that it made me think of is, uh, marketing, like at its core involves product, right? Like product, uh, it, it should be like involved in the packaging and like the price and all, all that within uh, traditional marketing. And we've kind of like moved away from that recently, but I do think that if you are a true marketing department, then that can be successful if you're able to provide like feedback loops, like to the product and you're working in tandem to develop the strategy. Cause one thing that stood out to me in your book is, oh, an SEO sounds a lot like a, a product manager. Like there's similar skills involved uh, and prioritization involved in that. Uh, because if you're just looking at keywords or if you're looking at volume and all that, it's overwhelming, right? There's so much of, of the market that you can uh, own that you're not going to be able to do it. And so you have to be like, where are we going to really be successful? And that's very much like to me, a uh, product manager skill. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think SEO should be a product manager, not a marketing manager. And, and I, again, I had the fortunate experience of, of doing that, being uh, on a product team. And, you know, I, I mentioned this in my book, when I discovered that product managers did the same job or were an SEO product managers doing the same job that I did as an SEO marketing manager, but I got a raise, I was convinced. Right. So like I'm doing the job already, but because I was called marketing, I was paid less, you know, I, I think done deal. So I, I really think it is a skill set of product managers and they're, you're more successful when you're in product 
And I actually think it's better for you know anyone's career to be on product and to be shaping things because you can turn around and point to something and say, I did that, I created that. You know, a product manager, it you know, in Silicon Valley, it's one of these things where like product managers are like CEOs of a product. Like I think that's more career building than just saying, well, I'm a, an SEO marketing manager and I help market something that someone else created. So if you can, even if you, again, if you are on marketing, but you can position what you've done as product, I think it's better for your career. Yeah, that's a, that's a great sound bite of being a, a CEO of product, right? Like a product manager is listening to this like that. I'll have to share this with the product managers. But uh, the other side of it too, is it's just much easier to bring something to market that you have a say in what you're bringing to market. You know what I mean? If you're able to shape what you're bringing to market as you're bringing it to market. It just makes sense like that. You're just going to have more success that way. And that goes back to having product market fit to begin with. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is kind of a, a controversial a take care of. So Rand Fishkin, like the founder and CEO of Moz, now founder of Spark Toro, recently heard him on a podcast talking about SEO. And basically he believes that there are better ways to, to go to market in 2022. And so he's not for his company, a SaaS company, martech company not investing too much in seo really at all and so assuming that i like in this scenario work at a company that's right for product-led seo should i uh invest in it over other strategies like where do you think it ranks in terms of marketing strategies i really think so i, I know I, I love rand and known him for years and, and you know he's done some amazing things for seo but I, I think it really depends on the company so for spark toro i agree with him i would not do seo for companies that really, you know, will only generate revenue from SEO. It's, you know, in my book, I talk about Zillow. Zillow is one of my favorite examples of product led SEO because Zillow drives so much of their traffic from individual addresses in America. They have a page for every address in America. They cannot do marketing for every single address in America other than through SEO. So for a company like that, if they neglected SEO, it would be all about brand and TV advertising and podcast advertising and media, right? You know, sponsoring planes and sports teams. Like how else do they create visibility for their brand? But the way they, they created and will continue to create visibility is by being visible on every single address. If I look for an address, the, their only competition on addresses in America are Google Maps and other products just like them who are trying to do better than them. So I think it really, really depends on the product uh, that you, you have. So for software like Spark Toro, yes, that, I think that would be challenging to rely on SEO. For something that is more consumer like Zillow or even um, Yelp's had its own challenges because they're literally competing against Google, but like something like that, SEO is going to be the best channel you can use because it'll be significantly less expensive. And if you do product with SEO, you're creating the product that you know users are looking for and want, and they're going to be searching and finding your product and you'll be building brand and authority sort of the slower way, but the better way. So, you know, every person that finds a Zillow page on their address or their neighbor's address now knows, well, if I find another house I want to buy, or if I have another neighbor that I want to look at, I'm going to use Zillow. I'm going directly to Zillow. So I, again, depends on what it is, but I think this is the really the only way to build brand and to build marketing in, in 2022 and well beyond if you have this kind of product. Yeah, yeah. You know, what's interesting about that is you're listing those examples like Zillow, Yelp, they've kind of become search engines for their industry, right? Like they went about it like we're going to like, you're, you're going to be able to search whatever you want within this industry. We're going to have everything indexed. And that's kind of like how they've owned the marketplace. And Amazon, I think, is the perfect example of essentially uh, being a search engine for e-commerce and just owning e-commerce in that way. So there's a big upside, uh, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. If you try to create uh, your own search engine, essentially, and you rely on the ultimate search engine of Google to initially push that. So, so yeah, just just sort of like shower shot thoughts there uh, on that. But moving on, uh, just logistics of launching a product led program. So talking, I think we have a strong case of why, why you should uh, invest in this. And if you are X, Y, and Z company, and like, if you have that product market fit, but then just logistics of how to, how we get this done. So where do you recommend newbies start with a product led SEO? And in, in other words, what would you do in the first you know, 30, 60, 90 days of being a, a director of SEO at a company? 
So I would start at the place that most people actually don't start doing SEO. So most people start SEO by digging into Google Search Console and they go into Google Analytics and they start looking at competitors and SEMrush and Ahrefs. The place I start is by understanding the users. So whenever I onboard a new client, I talk to them about who they want to be when they grow. Uh, who, they, who their ideal client is, how are they driving business right now? And I get some remarkable insights or, you know, I love um, it's a more of a mature company and they, they have a, some sort of customer support channel and they have that voice of the customer. They understand what the customer is looking for. They understand the customer's pain points. That's where I would start. So you, really, as you're starting a new role, whether you're, you've been doing SEO in the past or whether you're new at SEO, like understand who the customer is and understand what their needs and and desires are and start building towards that so think about well okay i understand let's say we're zillow i understand the motivation is i want to find the valuation of my house or i want to find uh, a safe neighborhood and then you once you have that down you say well if it works like this for the 10 people i talk to it works like this for the 10 you know blog what we're uh, customer support tickets I read, it probably works like this for the rest of the world. So now how do I build SEO around that? And if you already have a, a website that already exists and your, your job is to do SEO for that, are you hitting that mark? Are you generating the traffic you want from the intent and the needs of the users or are you not? And are you converting on what you've already done and what can you learn from what you've already, what, what already works? So that's where I would start just understanding what's working, what's not working and what should be working. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it, plays directly, I think, into into this next question too of if you're starting from the needs like of the users and you deep you prioritize deeply understanding them, you should, I think in theory, have less losses because you're not throwing things at the wall, you're not guessing as much. You have like a pretty good strategy to start out with. But I think there the will there will still be like missteps and mistakes. And so how do you know when to call it quits, like on, on a sprint, uh, if we're talking in product language, like on, on a sprint of SEO? So, so that's why I always love when the companies I talk to have already done a lot of performance marketing. They're already spending a lot of money in performance, or if they haven't, like, again, when I talk to companies, they have not, I tell them to go do performance marketing first. So there is no real SEO sprint. It's going to take a long time. You're building a product. I'd say some of my most successful SEO experiences have taken many, many months to launch anything. So with that amount of time, you know, we're, let's say the first month, we're just deciding what it is we're going to be launching. It could be months before the thing we've launched is even driving any traffic to even know if we're on the right track. So if you've done performance, then you'll have a good sense of like what you're going to do. Is it even going to work? Is there a user at the end of it? That's, it's a really a long-term mindset of how confident are you in the bet you're making? And what happens if your bet is wrong? And the other thing is when it comes to SEO, you can't make multiple bets because the bet that you're making, you really need to be all in. You want to throw all your resources at it and not say, well, I'm not really sure whether I'm going after this kind of customer or that kind of customer. So I'm going to split my resources and sort of make a half okay uh, version for this customer and a half okay version for that customer, because then you're really not satisfying anybody. So it's really like, who do I really think my SEO user is and that I'm going to build for that. And only once that is successful, will I iterate and build for the next kind of user. So I think that's, that's really important to keep in mind is if you're unsure, then you're building something that's not good enough for your audiences. Yeah. Yeah. The, the thing that stood out here is that marketing has like, yeah, become like a B testing or it feels like it's like synonymous with like just test a bunch of things and uh, like let, let the data like move you forward. But if you, yeah, start with just the user and narrowing it down, you don't have to do that as much, or you can at least like let that be more on performance marketing, learn from the mistakes of performance marketing uh, and the successes from them. So that once you do get to the stage of, of really like investing in organic and putting a lot of resources there, you can feel confident about the results and you don't feel like you have to hedge so much. Exactly. Yeah, you want to have as much data going in as possible. And I, I think, again, A-B testing doesn't really apply when it comes to building an SEO strategy because it takes you 18 months. There's no, um, did I do it right or did I not do it right? And I tell this to like everyone I work with, it's like, we're going to make a bet and we're never going to know whether this was the right bet or not because we'll have nothing to compare it against. So think about like Zillow. Zillow made one bet, didn't exist, right? When they, when they launched their product, it didn't exist. 
and it's worked out fantastically for them. But we have no idea what the other bets that they didn't do are, and we have no idea whether those would have been better off. So that that's the way I'd, I'd really you know, approach it. Look at, um, you know, again, Amazon. Amazon made a huge bet, you know, early on in their SEO, and it, it's massively successful. And they hoped it would be, but we don't know what, again, what they didn't do, what they did. I, I said you can compare Amazon to Walmart. Walmart didn't do it correctly, and they had better distribution, and Amazon won. So you don't know. You don't know until it's all done. There's no A-B test here. Yeah, yeah, well said. So the this next part, just uh, favorite examples. Which companies do you see doing this well? You've named a few, I think, throughout this episode, but any other ones you want to add to the, the list uh, that we should be looking at for product-led SEO? I think anytime you search something in a, a vertical and there's always a site that's number one. So in travel, it's TripAdvisor. In information, it's Wikipedia. In uh, homes, it's Zillow. In e-commerce, it's Amazon. So it's it's not it's not luck, right? They've built an amazing strategy and they nailed it. And it's not to say that those companies will always be successful at that. And there is you know certainly a brand aspect to this. So let's say B&H Photo is they're very successful at what they do and they dominate that space even though amazon sells similar products but then you look at who's who is not successful best buy is not number one in all those queries target is not number one in all those queries walmart is not number one right so like you look so you see those market leaders and they've done very well and it's not accidental the fact that they can own many many of those top positions so when everyone else seems to be doing the same thing and they're not necessarily seeing the same success so in addition to the examples I named, anytime you're doing a search and you're like, well, this company's always there, they're always there. There's a reason for that. Yeah. And uh, I think that this goes back to just for, to the beginning of the episode where you talk about like product market fit and strategy, like going into product. Uh, the thing that makes me think about is how hard slash impossible this is for startups to do when they have multiple verticals. When you try to go to market and say like, I, and, and lead with the vision of like, okay, we want to eventually be here. Like our TAM is this, we want this to capture this entire market. Instead of saying, we're going to be someone's favorite, one person's favorite, one vertical is like favorite capturing that and then moving on to the next vertical. Right. And so you've just uh, given, I think like a good example of that by saying what this looks like, by the way, is owning a vertical and uh, Zillow, for instance, like moving on from like one, one vertical to the next, but like probably starting with uh, houses, right? Like versus like commercial or something, but they could move on to that. I don't know if they already have, but that would be one example. Yeah. I mean, the really important thing is understanding the user. So Zillow owns what we think of home values today, but there's potentially something in home values in the future, which that's, there's room for an innovator there. And when that changes, if you come up with that idea, you can own the behavior change there. So uh, TripAdvisor, they still own the travel space. But if something changes in the way we start looking for travel reviews, there's an opportunity there because the behavior has changed. So this other company can go and create that. So I keep that in mind that Zillow doesn't get to own everything around home valuations forever if user behavior and user intent changes. And if you can predict that and you can build that, you know, there was a company I was, again, I was talking to today about e-commerce. They're competing against everyone in e-commerce. They're competing against Amazon. They're competing against Costco. They're competing against Walmart. They're not dead in the water. If they can understand their users better and create a better experience for those users, they could end up owning that vertical in the way those users search for it and those users want to buy. But if all they're going to do is say, well, Walmart and, and Amazon are very successful at this, so we're going to replicate exactly their strategy, then they're always going to be second fiddle to them. And you know, why would you buy from them? They, maybe if you discovered them, their experience could be better, their pricing could be better, but you'd have to discover that. But if they can come up with a, a different strategy of how you're going to find them to begin with and position themselves that way in the way that users are looking for them, they have a whole different opportunity to really own that vertical. Yeah, TripAdvisor, I think will be a fun one to watch specifically because the way that we travel uh, and how, how often we travel is obviously shifted so much like since the launch of their company. So. COVID, like obviously being, being uh, one very recently, but also before that you have VRBO and uh, Air Airbnb, you have like Airbnb, both like coming in of saying like the way you travel is different now. And you have a lot of people buying into that. And so if you own a space that, that eventually becomes obsolete, you know, or becomes less popular, 
how valuable is is owning that vertical so that's like another like business level thing to consider yeah well if i could throw some shade there on airbnb uh, i know airbnb like one of the things you want to look at when you want to understand the seo success of any sort of company is the brand versus non-brand breakdown and it's very important to really understand this like if you have a lot of visibility on your brand and in airbnb's case the word airbnb then um that's good right that's good on search because you have all that traffic but if you don't have any visibility and non-brand that's not really seo success that's uh pr success that is brand authority success so airbnb actually does not have that much visibility when you search for um, hotels to stay in in san francisco they're, you're not finding airbnb airbnb has done a fantastic job of design and structure and customer experience and all those other pieces but i, I don't know that their visibility is really maximized the way TripAdvisor is. So TripAdvisor, if we get their breakdown, it, it could be only 40% branded traffic versus 60% non-branded traffic. That's fantastic. So if I'm searching for the review of the Hilton in San Francisco, I'm going to find TripAdvisor. If I'm searching for um, things to do in San Francisco, I'm going to find TripAdvisor. Those are non-branded queries. That's the kind of thing that I mean when you really own a vertical, like everything around the travel space, they own it. Whereas Airbnb, if I'm searching for homes to stay in in san francisco yes airbnb might have that but that's not a huge representation of traffic and surprisingly you know i did some research on this for a client facebook actually does a really good job of non-brand traffic too so despite the fact that facebook is one of the largest brands and if you type the letter f into google google's going to suggest facebook to you despite the fact that it's one of the top search terms on google they still have 60 percent of the traffic's non-branded and it's coming from all those like i want to find people that love cats or I want to find people that like to play chess, like all those other things, right? Or look up your own personal name. So there is a significant amount of non-branded traffic, which means that Facebook is also doing a very good job, even though it's Facebook's a walled garden of in, being logged into Facebook, they're still doing a very good job of creating all this discovery around the things they do. So you could become a Facebook user or log into Facebook. So when, it, when you think about SEO, SEO success, it really is about the discovery of, of users or search outside of what your brand is and that i think is it you know very important to focus on yeah no i think that's a good call out i definitely don't think uh airbnb has necessarily done a done a good job with seo i'm more interested in like that that search term right like of looking for renting a house right versus renting a hotel and if that's something that TripAdvisor will either jump into and in owning that traffic and even owning like that as a product or if it's something that airbnb is going to look into or if nobody does it, like it's it's just a, an interesting thought of like since the markets change, like I'm just I'm more likely to stay at a home like through Airbnb or something like that than a hotel at this point, and that wasn't a wasn't a thing earlier. And so yeah, so seeing how how that changes, I think will be fun. Yeah. Okay, so just next steps, advice on the strategy in general. So content marketers bought into this they're like actually i think that's a really good pairing with what we're trying to do with what my company is the stage we're at we have product market fit but uh have some doubts or something standing their way what advice would you give them to to get started i'd really start understanding your market and understanding what users want and trying to understand that buyer's journey and that's where you can start you know give yourself as much license to be creative as possible and that's where you find sort of the white spaces within search so, um, you know, like you said, Airbnb, so maybe the homes to stay in or sanitized homes to stay in, if that's something that people start looking for, you might realize there's not a lot of search there. There's not a lot of results there, but you believe based on your research that there's a lot of demand. So when you start creating that content, you do start creating the demand and you front run it. And then like, again, exactly like Zillow, someone finds their, their neighbor's valuation on Zillow and they're like, well, I can now check out everyone I know. I can check out my parents. I can check out my friends. So now they're creating demand and there's more search. So that's what I'd say is like deep dive into your market, deep dive into your customers and start looking for those white spaces as a content person, as an SEO person, and give yourself as much freedom and space to be creative. And that's where your success will lie. Yeah, I, I, I love ending on that because by the time that the tactic is used by everyone, the, by the time it's obvious, it's probably going to be too late, right? And so what you talked about is by the time like like it shows up that there's like a big traffic volume and by the time like you've gotten to that demand, uh, it's probably like too late to, to start implementing because there, there will be someone who like based on gut and based on like a smaller sample size is able to like implement this plan because they talk to users first, right? Rather than like relying on, on search traffic uh, to drive their SEO strategy. Exactly. Hrefs is only $99 a month. 
and anyone with $99 a month can go find that exact same keyword. So everyone can go copy the exact same strategy. Whereas if you understand your users and you understand their needs and their needs are not being met and you create for them, that can't be bought. Uh, so good. Okay. <laughs> I'm excited uh, to wrap up on that, but uh, where should people go to learn more about you to purchase your book? Just uh, tell people how they can learn more about product led SEO. So the, the book is on Amazon. So just look for product led SEO. Uh, you can find me at on LinkedIn. I'll add any connection. Just, just find me on LinkedIn. Eli Schwartz.co is my own personal site and I have a, a infrequent email list. And I also have a website for the book, which I'll be expanding with more concepts around product led SEO, product led SEO.com. And you can follow me on Twitter at five L E. And however anyone chooses to connect with me, great, but definitely find the book. That should be the easiest to find. I can vouch for it. I read it on the plane uh, a few, few months ago and uh, gives you a lot to think about both in terms of how you go about marketing, how you think about product and just a way that people are doing SEO that you don't need a, a $99 uh, tool for and uh, you can do better than the person that has the, the $99 a month tool. So thank you again, Eli, for coming on. Really enjoyed this conversation and hope you can stay in touch. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Content Logistics. This episode is produced by Motion, a done-for-you B2B podcasting agency for busy marketers. If you liked what you heard, please follow the show on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts.